This is part four in the video series, Introduction to Literary Theory, the topic of this video is feminism and gender studies, which also uh, encapsulates uh, queer theory. And we'll talk about all this uh, in this video. Um, just to tell you that, that while the material that I cover here is included in chapter six, um, I depart slightly from um, from Dobie's organization of, of the chapter. She uses um, uh, Elaine Showalter's uh, historical frame to talk about the, the uh, development of feminism. And she, so, so Showalter had divided this into three periods, the feminine, the female, and the feminist. Uh, and this is in Showalter's book, The the New Feminist Criticism, that came out in 1985. I do it a little different. Uh, I, I guess one could say I use a slightly more traditional framework. I use the, the terms first wave feminism, second wave feminism, and third wave fem feminism. Just a little easier for me to explain. Um, and I'm also going to, to introduce you to some... Um, some 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 writers and books that are not mentioned in chapter six. So we'll start just by talking generally about feminism. Historically, feminist criticism has borrowed a great deal from psychology and Marxism. And there are basically two strains that we're going to look at. There, there are feminists who seek to understand and affirm the unique properties of the female imagination and modes of expression, and this is called gynocriticism. And uh, they're, they're looking for ways that, that, that women write and think that, that have been traditionally ignored or misunderstood by a male-centered literary and crit critical tradition, which is defined as androcentric or male-centered, or sometimes you'll see the terms phallocentric or phallogocentric. That's a portmanteau word uh, linking the word phallus to, um, to the word logos or word. Uh, so you'll see these terms androcentric or phallocentric or phallogocentric to refer to the male-centered literary and critical t tradition. Other feminist critics, meanwhile, focus more on exposing and challenging a misogynistic patriarchal hegemon that empowers men while disenfranchising and subjugating women, instill instilling a normative false consciousness. Now, there's a term borrowed from Marxist criticism, uh, a normative false consciousness through cultural work that includes, of course, art and literature. So what I'm going to do now is, is start talking, uh, identifying some of the key figures in these different periods of the, the evolution of feminist thinking, going all the way back to the late 18th century. But for as long as women have been writing, they have documented their experiences as marginalized others and sought acknowledgement and fair treatment by men. In the early 15th century, for example, the French writer Christine de Pizan wrote Le Livre de la Cité des Dames, uh, The Book of the City of Women. And it, it's, a, it's a work that extolled famous women historically for their significant contributions to society. But during the Enlightenment in the 18th century, an increasing number of, of highly literate, very well-educated women began participating in debates about women's roles in both the public and domestic sphere. And this today, they, di they didn't think of themselves as, as feminists the way, the way we think of them now, but this is the beginning of the so-called first wave of feminism. And it was focused primarily on demands for women to be treated as equals to men, particularly when it came to their education and legal rights. And this was a long wave of feminism that continued throughout the 19th century and into the early 20th century. One of the first was a French novelist and playwright named Olympe de Gouges, um, who was, uh, in addition to being a feminist, uh, an outspoken opponent of the slave trade in the French colonies. She was uh, an enthusiastic supporter of the French Revolution in 1789, 
But when the revolutionary government, the National Assembly, did not adequately recognize women's rights, she published uh, the work for which she is best remembered today, the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and of the Female Citizen. That came out in 1791, and it would inspire the English writer Mary Wollstonecraft less than a year later. Her fate was pretty terrible, Olympe de Gouges, in um, the, the, the complex, charged political atmosphere of post-revolutionary France. Uh, she allied herself to the wrong political party, the, the, the more moderate party, and she was guillotined in 1793. So there's Mary Wollstonecraft, who died a few years later in 1797 under completely different circumstances. She's perhaps best known today as the mother of Mary Shelley, the author of uh, Frankenstein. And after giving birth to Mary, she, um, she developed an, uh, an infection and uh, died within days of Mary's birth. But um, she is the author of one of the earliest English language feminist polemics, the vindication of the rights of woman uh, with strictures on political and moral subjects. And the vindication does not radically challenge the institutions of marriage and family that had defined women's place in society. But Wollstonecraft does call for women to be given access to education and treated as the moral and intellectual equals of men rather than being infantilized and fetishized by them. So this is uh, some people see this this document as this, in 1792 is really the beginning of uh, of intellectual feminism. We're going to skip ahead quite a bit here to the 20th century. Virginia Woolf, who was born in 1882, her father Leslie Stephen was a very prominent public intellectual and literary critic, and he did not hold progressive views on female education. And basically it was a spokesman for Victorian patriarchy. In uh, 1929, she published A Room of One's Own, which focused specifically on the problem of female authorship and the material conditions that kept women from being as artistically or creatively successful as men. Her point in this book is that historically, women had been deprived of the resources necessary to pursue creative endeavors, uh, like money, for example, um, which can purchase time to devote to and, and leisure to devote to, to reading and writing. In a really famous section of the essay, she tells the story of Shakespeare's imaginary sister, Judith, who uh, she imagines being just as talented as her brother, but denied the same opportunities. And she ends up uh, pregnant, I think, by a, uh, by a theater manager, I think, and she commits suicide. So these are some of the, the signature works of first wave feminism. The second wave began with the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir's book, The Second Sex, which appeared in 1949. But second wave feminism really ramped up in the English speaking world during the 1960s cultural revolution. Um, Betty Friedan's book came out in 1963. We'll look at that in just a minute. Not only was this generation of feminists arguing for equal rights and opportunities, all the, the things that first wave feminists fought for, but also, and this is the important distinction, they, they were critiquing the patriarchal institutions and social practices and cultural forms in some the entire Western gender ideology that impinged on women's lives. And this really starts with Betty Friedan in 1963. Um, she was inspired, there, there it is, The Feminine Mystique. She was inspired by Simone de Beauvoir's book, uh, The Second Sex, which uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, um, which, which examined the structures and myths that subjugated women to men. And The Feminine Mystique challenged the post-World War belief that women should find meaning and fulfillment in their duties as housewives and as mother figures. 
Here's Kate Millett, who died just, uh, just a few years ago. It's a great photograph of her. I love that picture. Her book, Sexual Politics, 1970. Uh, Kate Millett, her, her, her thesis is that patriarchy is ideological rather than natural or God-given. That um, unlike the biological difference of sex, biological sex, gender traits or masculinity and femininity are not innate or biological, but, but are social constructs used to perpetuate the subjugation of women. And she was among the first to examine <clears throat> to examine the ways that popular cultural forms, including works of art and literature, reflected and sustained the priorities and prerogatives of patriarchy. This is Germaine Greer, born in 1939. And her book, The Female Eunuch, also 1970. Uh, 1970 was a watershed year for second wave feminism, uh, was focused more on women's sexuality and the ways that women had been raised uh, and educated uh, to fear and suppress sexual urges in compliance with male fantasies of, uh, of the way women should be. Which, which basically meant monogamous and devoted to their husbands. <laughs> For students of literature, Gilbert and Gubar are particularly important. Uh, they wrote in 1979 a, a pioneering piece of feminist literary criticism, uh, The Mad Woman in the Attic, The Woman Writer and the 19th Century Literary Imagination. This book looks at a group of 19th century women writers, uh, Charlotte Bronta, for example, whose character Bertha Mason in Jane Eyre is the eponymous mad woman of the title of the book. But they look at Emily Dickinson and other, other women writers whose works, they argue, reflect patriarchal stereotypes of women, making uh, angels out of compliant housewives and dutiful daughters, and on the other hand, demons, monsters, mad women, uh, uh, basically criminalizing independent or sexually aggressive women. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. So as part of second wave feminism, there's a subgroup that I've identified here called the French feminists. And, um, they're, they're a little different. A second wave feminism took, took, took a different form in France, but it would have the, 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 the women that we're going to talk about here. Um, there are really four. I don't, I don't talk about uh, Irdi Gade, but um, the other three I talk about, they, they would have a tremendous influence on English literary criticism. Um, French feminist theory tends to be a, a lot more philosophical, um, less accessible to popular readers. Um, it, it, it's a little less political and delves into uh, psychology, especially Lacanian psychoanalysis and um, linguistics. But it really started with Simone de Beauvoir in uh, 1949, Le Deuxième Saxe. And then that, now, the interesting thing about this book is it was translated in the early 1950s and, and had a big, um, you know, a big impact on the emergence of second wave feminism in the English speaking world. Um, but there were a lot of criticisms of the English translation that it was it was not very good. It left out parts of her argument. And it wasn't until 2009 that a, a new, more um, scholarly edition of of the book, The Second Sex, became available. So a number of philosophical works in the late 1970s used Lacanian psychoanalysis and linguistics to develop the notion of a, a distinctly feminine language that, that originated in women's unique bodily experiences as a counter to phallocentric cultural hegemony, and that this language 
um, once one tapped into it, could revolutionize female expression. And uh, the, the woman you see pictured here, uh, Aileen Sisu, um, wrote a really famous, very famous essay, uh, Le Rire de la Meduse, uh, The Laugh, The Laugh of the Medusa, um, in which Sisu pioneered the phrase l'écriture féminine, or, or womanly writing, to describe this, this transgressive feminine language. Um, another French feminist, Julia Cristeva. Sisu's essay, Laugh of the Medusa, was actually the first, the first piece of French feminist criticism I ever read. Um, blew my mind actually i remember i remember it i still have my my early annotated copy of of that essay very dense and difficult to read um this is julia kristeva um who has published a number of uh really influential books on um women and language uh this one in 1977 polylogue was translated into English in 1980 as Desire in Language. And there are a couple of other books that are just as important. Um, one that comes to mind is Revolution and Poetic Language. Um, but I chose this one. Uh, she uses the term uh, semiotic to distinguish a, a point of origin for female identity that's associated with the maternal and the feminine in contrast to uh, the phallogocentric symbolic order of patriarchy, of um, of law and order, and she argues that the potential for the revitalization of women's expression lies in a return to the semiotic, which, in her work, she she postulates as a kind of proto language of bodily experience that um, that disappears uh, as as women in early childhood psychology separate themselves from their mothers and enter what she calls the symbolic order. And again, all of that is, is inflected by um, Lacanian psychoanalytic theory. So those are the French feminists. And finally, we're going to talk about the third wave of feminism. And this, this began in the 1980s and 90s, um, as a critique of the mostly white previous generation of second wave feminists, which had ignored the ways in which race and sexual orientation complicated the female experience of patriarchy. So during this period, too, uh, queer theory and gender studies found a foothold in the academy, and this coincided with a shift away from thinking about gender and sexuality in essentialist binary terms, male, female, masculine, feminine, straight, gay, and toward a notion of personal identity that is fluid and performative. And these two words, essentialist and performative, uh, should be highlighted and pay attention to the way that Doby um, talks about those two terms in chapter six. And because of the performative nature of identity, there is the potential for um, transgression and uh, revolutionary change. So I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in the context of identifying um, some of the women associated with third wave feminism, many of whom that I talk about here anyway are now deceased. Some of them died um, before they should have, before their time. This is Bell Hooks, who died just a couple of years ago. Um, um, famous for lots of reasons, but this book, Ain't I a Woman, uh, she, she, that's a title that she adapted from a Sojourner Truth, uh, 19th century Sojourner Truth speech. Um, in this book, Hooks, Hooks makes the point that historically, a combination of sexism and racism had assured that black women were the lowest social status of any group in American society. And that, and that by ignoring racial questions, second wave feminists, most of them white women, devalued black femininity and contributed to the oppression, the continued oppression of uh, black women. This is Gloria Anzadua, 
in her book, Borderlands, 1987. This is an autobiographical book. She talks a lot about about going to school and, and being physically punished for, for not speaking English properly. Uh, this book examines the, the socially and linguistically complex position of Mexican-American Mexican Chicana identity in the Southwest United States. Very interesting. Controversial book. I teach part of it in my English 1101 classes, actually. And here's Judith Butler, her book, Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity. This is one of uh, two really important books published in 1990, uh, important for feminism, important for queer theory. And, and these books dismantle the entire essentialist binary logics of male, female, masculine, feminine, straight, gay, um, binaries that had largely been endorsed by second wave feminists, but that nevertheless, Butler would argue, perpetuated patriarchal oppression. So instead, uh, this book and uh, Sedgwick's book, which we'll talk about next, uh, emphasize the essentially performative nature of gender and sexuality and the fluid, flexile nature of individual identity and accepting this, the possibility it opens for liberation and uh, social transformation. And here's Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick, who died a few years ago, 2017. And this is her book. Um, the textbook, Dobie mentions another book titled Tendencies, which came out a few years after this one. But this, Epistemology of the Closet, this is the work by which Sedgwick is known and uh, is considered a cornerstone of queer theory. So just to summarize here, identify some of the priorities of uh, feminist critics or, or any critic working in the field of, of queer theory, gender studies, feminism. One of the goals is to expand the literary canon by recovering marginalized voices and embracing alternate literary genres like, like, uh, like diaries and journals and travel, travel books, things of that nature. Kate Chopin um, was uh, um, rediscovered during the 1960s feminist movement. That's just one, one example. These critics also look for features that distinguish alternate modes of seeing, saying, and being from androcentric or phallocentric cultural norms. And finally, examine the ways that authors and their creations reflect or resist sexual norms and gender ideology. And that concludes this video on feminism and gender studies. It's a portrait of Romaine Brooks there. Really cool. Early 20th century artist.